Hello. Uh, good morning, everyone. My name is Su Zhang Fei. I will be introducing the next three speakers. Um, so uh, um, the next speaker is uh, uh, Dr. Alison Miller. Uh, Alison is a professor uh, of biology at St. Louis University, but also a member and the principal investigator of the Danforth Plant Science Center. And uh, look forward to your talk. Thank you. Good morning, everybody. I can use this one, that's fine. It's such an honor and pleasure to be here. This is my first time at NAPB, and I'd like to thank the organizers and Jody and, and the local hosts here at Iowa State, especially for your patience with me when you showed the slide yesterday that there were 375 registrants. Uh, I'm number 374. I was one of those people that was very, very late. So I really appreciate all of the accommodation and the opportunity to be here. I've been so inspired and motivated by the talks so far, and I'm looking forward to the ones that are coming up. Today I'd like to switch gears a little bit um, from thinking about annual crops um, to more perennial crops, which has been the focus of my research lab uh, for, for the past 20 years or so. So if you think about the plants that occur in nature and that occur even here in the natural prairie of Iowa, they are overwhelmingly perennial herbaceous species. These are species that never entered the domestication pipeline or very rarely did, uh, whereas we see many domesticated annuals and many domesticated perennial woody crops. But these perennial uh, herbaceous crops are coming under domestication as shown in the background here. Um, our colleagues, at the Land Institute in Salina, Kansas, and many of their collaborators around the country and the world have been working to domesticate perennial herbaceous species. And one of them that you might have heard of is intermediate wheatgrass, Dinopyrum intermedium, also known as Kernza. So why are people trying to bring perennial herbaceous species into uh, the domestication pipeline? Well, the secret really lies below ground. And as we're becoming increasingly aware of and concerned about soil loss, it's been estimated that half of the world's topsoil has been lost in the last 150 years. We're thinking about a range of different potential solutions to try to mitigate that problem. Many of, which have, many of those solutions have been addressed here. I suspect we'll hear more coming up. But I'm interested primarily in this, in this idea. Can we domesticate perennial herbaceous species? And can we select not only for increased yield, but also enhanced ecosystem function? So if you're perennial herbaceous grain curious, I can point you to Amazon, where you can find some kerns of flour. This is delicious in pancakes and cookies. My kids ask for it by name. Uh, you can also try some kerns of beer. Uh, which is now being distributed nationally, not yet in St. Louis, unfortunately, uh, from Dogfish Head Brewery. So the questions that we're thinking about in my lab are really two, uh, fall into two major categories. One is just how do long-lived plants do it? And how do their traits change over time? It's a very basic plant science question. But we're also interested in trying to use that information to expedite the breeding process. Now, because perennial herbaceous species have really only very relatively recently entered this domestication pipeline, a lot of us are feeling a great urgency of now to move this along as, as quickly as we can. So we're focused on plant phenomics. We're thinking about early stage selection. Can we use information that we glean from seeds and seedlings to predict traits that we later see in the field? And can we use uh, high dimensional data to try to develop phenomic selection pipelines? So plant phenomics then just encompasses these multi-dimensional uh, data describing various aspects of plant form from cells on up to populations. The phenomic selection pipelines, as many in this audience know, are using these high dimensional data um, to, to try, such as NIR or, or, or uh, various hyperspectral imaging to generate phenomic estimated breeding values. Full disclosure, we're, we're not there yet. We're still asking really, really fundamental questions about how we, that might enable us to uh, develop phenomics in perennial species. And that's what I really want to talk about today. 
So harnessing multiple, multiple dimensions of perennial plant phenotypic variation for crop improvement and de novo domestication. I'm gonna walk you through two projects that we've been running in my lab group. Um, first is a project that's asking how traits expressed at different times and in different growth conditions relate to one another. The second question is can we use phenomics then to begin to optimize and expedite domestication and breeding in these perennial herbaceous species? And, and I think and hope we can, but we are very early on in this process and I'm very eager for your feedback and thoughts on what we're up to here. So first, how do traits expressed at different times and in different growth conditions relate to each other? This work has been led by a research scientist in my lab group, uh, Matthew Rubin. We started by taking a broad look. When you think about domesticating species that have never been domesticated before, where do you even start? Uh, Kernza is a species, intermediate wheatgrass is a species that is the relatively farthest along, but there are many, many things um, that we might consider. My background is in botany and evolutionary biology, so I really wanted to, to uh, sample as a fairly broad representation. So we picked three plant families, the sunflower family, the grass family, uh, and the legume family. We threw in the species that our collaborators at the Land Institute have been particularly interested in, Thinopyrum intermedium, an oil seed, Silphium integrifolium, uh, a forage, Onobricus viciifolia, also known as sainfoin, uh, perennial metacago, and several other perennial species that we've been thinking about and our collaborators have been thinking about as well. So we started a comprehensive phenotyping program with the seeds. So the way this, this project has kind of played out is that we are imaging seeds and weighing seeds to start. We're then looking at germination rates. We're destructively harvesting a small subset of samples for above and below ground biomass. We're imaging plants from the side and top views using RGB and near infrared and, a, and an automated phenotyper at the Danforth Center. We're collecting various types of spectral data on seedlings. And then we are throwing all of these plants into a U-Haul and taking them out to our field site at the Shaw Nature Reserve as part of the Missouri Botanical Garden just outside of St. Louis, where we've uh, planted them into a space plant nursery where we've been monitoring flowering time, height, and yield. I think we're in our third year now. All right, so the experimental design here is that we had 4,560 plants representing these 13 perennial herbaceous species. Uh, shout out to the, to the USDA Grin system where we, where we obtain most of these plants. We have 350 populations or accessions. We image them for an average of 10 days over the course of three to five weeks, resulting in 50,000 images. And again, we're looking both at side view imaging uh, and uh, top down. We're also becoming increasingly interested in spectral traits measured in a variety of ways. We used a phenovation crop reporter to measure anthocyanin index, a chlorophyll index, and uh, FVFM on all of these individual plants. And then we put these on our, let's see if I can get this to run, on our automated phenotyper at the Danforth Center, which um, if you, if you haven't had a chance to visit the Danforth Center in St. Louis, this is a large growth chamber that houses 1,140 plants at a time and then waters and weighs them to a specified rate and images, images them daily or whatever weight we set uh, from the side and uh, top view in both NIR and RGB. I hate to brag, but we doubled the number of species that had ever been on this on this phenotyper with our first experiment. And it's been really fun to see how we can apply these, how we can apply these tools that have been developed for model systems and annual grains uh, in, in a wide range of species. All right, it'll just take just a minute to get off my... So this is just another view of the phenotyper. So again, then we're, we're visualizing these plants and what we're beginning to see is how we can estimate different aspects of the phenotypes of these early stage perennial plants. 
So this is one individual measured over five weeks. Here's the second individual. You can see they're quite different in size. They're quite different in growth rate. And we've been able to use then a time series to estimate how quickly uh, different populations are growing over time and how they differ from one another. Also, um, how those, uh, also we've been able to see that uh, Images taken at different days after planting, DAP, are obviously very highly correlated with one another. Another thing we've been thinking about is how color might be able to be used as a multidimensional trait. Um, so we've, we've extracted HSV values using the plant CV pipeline developed at the Danforth Center for hue, value, and saturation to try to quantify this variation that our eyes are detecting um, but that it has been historically difficult to do. So the way, just taking one example here, hue um, is a 360 degree uh, measure of color. Each line here is a different species, so you can see each species has a different, uh, slightly different hue profile. When we look at the statistics here, again, the, the hue is going across the x-axis here, and our statistics um, just show the distribution of these values. Only our our, only our statistically significant values are shown here. And I'll just point out that we can reliably um, identify plants to family at almost any hue, and we can reliably identify our plants to species as well. That just set, suggests that these data are, are rich and informative. We've used various machine learning approaches to then try to predict um, which, which families and which species individuals assign to, and we can do this with a very high uh, with very high probability, both for families shown in the previous slide and for individual species. So again, we're just looking for very, very high density forms of data that we might be able to use in these, uh, ultimately in these phenomic selection pipelines where we're trying to move towards. So all of the data that I just talked about are things we looked at uh, under controlled conditions in the Danforth Center. Once we got the plants out to the field, we started measuring flowering time, height, and yield. And what we're interested in here is trying to see if there's co-variation between traits measured under controlled conditions, uh, particularly those spectral traits I mentioned, and then traits that we later see in the field. So I'm going to show a series of correlation matrices here. Any square is a significant result if there's a color to it. Um, the blue squares represent positive correlations, the red squares uh, negative correlations, and we're looking at early life stage traits um, from seeds to growth um, up through the spectral signatures and their correlation with later life stage traits. And when we look at all of the species, remember there were 13 together, we are seeing strong patterns of both positive and negative correlations for various traits. I'm going to use one species as an example, Silphium and Tigrifolium. Um, and here we were able to detect that early life stage traits measured under controlled conditions do correlate with traits we see in the field. So for example, here are some seed traits, and we can see that these seed traits, um, area, length, and width, are negatively correlated with the incidence of orange rust, also negatively correlated with the number of heads uh, that we see on individual flowers. So that seed size is then positively correlated the seed size of the planted seed positively correlated with the seed size we see in the field. Growth rate here, we also see a negative, uh, a negative relationship uh, with, with the uh, days to flowering and a positive relationship uh, with height. And then this particular measure, these are just individual images from individual days, but when we look at rate, we see a positive correlation between the growth rate of the seedling and uh, the, the growth of this plant and the production of the plant in the field. Lastly, we're the, uh, the hue value and saturation values, we're also picking up some negative correlations with field traits. So these data answer a couple of questions for us. One, we can capture these multidimensional data in, within uh, the seedlings, and we can use them in a way that is informative and shows us something about what uh, the plants might do later on in the field. So how do traits expressed at different times and in different conditions relate to one another? Um, the traits we looked at are accurately predicting both the family and the species, and they're correlated with in-field phenotypes. So then we wanted to move from this very large exploration, basically, of 13 species to a smaller subset of species and a more focused analysis 
to, to again see if we can use this approach uh, of characterizing variation, phenotypic variation in early life stages to begin to optimize and expedite domestication and breeding of perennial herbaceous species. So this is a project that is, like many of the projects mentioned here, a huge collaboration, again, with Matthew Rubin and our breeder friends at the Land Institute, Brandon Schlotman, David Van Tassel, and Lee DeHaan. Uh, we're also working with folks I did not have good pictures of, Luis Diaz-Garcia, Jenna Hirschberger, who's here, Jesse Poland, Jared Crane, uh, and a number of really phenomenal technicians and students. So the title of this project is Reimagining Crop Domestication in the Era of High Throughput Phenomics. It's funded by the Foundation for Food and Agriculture Research, and we're trying to ask two questions here. Can elite individuals of perennial species be predicted by phenomic relatedness models based, based on seedling observations and high dimensional traits? And then can phenomic selection enhance or even replace genomic selection to accelerate breeding of these species? A portion of this project is a paired genomic selection study with intermediate wheatgrass or Kernza. I'm, I'm not going to talk about that here today. It's, it's, there isn't much to talk about because we're just getting it started in the context of this project. So I'll focus here on this first question. So we've taken three of the 13 species we looked at in the previous study, intermediate wheatgrass, sainfoin, and sillflower, or silphium. And we've started this project at the seed where we are individually imaging each individual seed that's going into this project. This is Jack Braley, who was just working on this this summer with intermediate wheatgrass seeds. Those individually labeled seeds are then planted and germination is monitored in our growth chambers at the Danforth Center. Ultimately, those plants are going to go back onto the phenotyper that I mentioned earlier. Um, but we started a new uh, project here where we're trying out a number of handheld spectrometers to see if we can detect um, spectral signatures using these inexpensive tools. This is, I'm sorry, Jenna, this is the only picture I have of you and Trevor. But this is a project that Jenna and Trevor have been uh, spearheading that's turning out to be a really interesting uh, investigation of, of these tools we might mo be moving towards in a moment. OK, so some preliminary data. If we look at our NIR data from, collected from the phenotyper at the Danforth Center, we're seeing, again, these same patterns that we picked up in our initial study, where we can use NIR data uh, to predictably assign individuals to their correct population, um, to their correct treatment. I forgot to mention, in this study, we are running a drought treatment as well on the phenotyper, along with a control. And we're also detecting that interaction of population and treatment. In other words, we're seeing a signature in the NIR data of both the genotype and the environment that these seedlings are in. We're also, again, able to use our random forest approach to predict better than random uh, the actual populations to which these individuals assign. So once all of our plants, our three species, we have um, we have a, a couple of thousand individuals per, and we're doing this over the course of multiple years. Once we've collected these data under controlled conditions, um, we transported them out to our field site outside of St. Louis um, and are also planting a set in Salina, Kansas, where we're again then beginning to collect these in-field phenotypic data. And so this is a, pro a project and a, a, a process that is very much uh, it happening at the moment. So I can only speak of what we've been able to see for Sainfoin on a Brichus visiofolia this year. Uh, but if we look at the near infrared data um, that we collected um, under the controlled conditions, we can see that the first principal component that explains 65% of the variation in the seedling is positively associated with flowering date, plant width, plant height, biomass, and total flower number in the field. We can also see, looking at hue, again, this, um, this color parameter, the first principal component that explains 35% of the variation is negatively correlated with plant height, width, biomass, and total flowering time. So what these data suggest is that we might be able to use these, these contemporary phen um, phenotypic approaches on seedlings um, to begin to expedite see early stage selection, hopefully, uh, that will shorten the time length needed uh, to make selections on these long-lived perennial herbaceous species. So 
How are we harnessing these multiple dimensions? Well, I just recapped it, but I'll say it again here. Just to kind of address the questions I asked initially, how do traits expressed at different times and different growth conditions relate to one another? Um, they, they are correlated uh, from the controlled conditions to the field conditions that we saw. And can we use plant phenomics to optimize and expedite the domestication of perennial herbaceous species? I think it looks promising. There's so much work to be done in this area and so much we can explore. Um, but we're, we're encouraged by what we're seeing. So before I go, I'd like to just acknowledge our funding sources, FFAR and the Land Institute, St. Louis University and the Danforth Center, and then the Shaw Nature Reserve. Uh, the wonderful students and technicians and postdocs who've been working on this project. Uh, this picture I took on Monday, we welcomed four new graduate students to the lab and we put them straight to work and they're doing a great job. And I wanted to just end up by saying that we're recruiting postdoctoral scholars and visiting scientists to work on this project and others. So if you're interested, I, I posted some of the descriptions on the lab website or just find me here. Thanks so much, everybody.